Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Michigan Competitive Committee. Uh, we're going to start off where we left off and ask Mr. James Freed, part here on city manager, to please come forward. James, thanks for um, allowing us to interrupt, completely interrupt your day and sticking around until this afternoon. And uh, please proceed when you're ready. Shawarma at lunch, so I'm all bounced back. Um, can I ask you have my hard copy presented in front of you? Okay, you. excellent. Thank you. Well, again, my name is James Freed. I am from the city of Port here on Michigan, home of the Blue Water Bridge, Thomas Edison, and our annual Bayview to Mackinac race, yacht race every year. I come today because I believe that Port Huron is not only an excellent case study in the issue of unfunded liabilities, but also an excellent case study in communities that haven't sat idly by. So this uh, conversation really began in Port Huron in 2015. I'll walk through our slides at this point. In 2015, when MERS conducted an updated valuation or experience study uh, regarding our valuation of our unfunded liabilities. And there were some major changes uh, factored into that new valuation, including we adjusted mortality tables to bring updated mortality tables. Our, our beneficiaries are living longer. We lowered our assumed rate of return from just north of 8% to 7 and 3 quarter percent, which I believe, in my professional opinion, is still overly optimistic. And we required, we required shorter and fixed amortization periods. Essentially, we went from a rolling amortization to a fixed amortization, which uh, all these three things factored in uh, substantially created our ARC payment to rise at a substantial rate. The city of Port Huron has an unfunded pension liability of $71 million. The annual pension contribution in 2017 and 18 will be $4.9 million. That's more than a 115% increase in eight years when it was 2.25 million. When I became city manager in 2014, that annual contribution was 3.2 million. Our annual, our, our, our OPEB, our retiree health care fund, is underfunded by $48 million. The annual contribution for that is $3.8 million this year. I gave a testimony to the House about a month ago, and since that and it was $3 million. And since that time, we received a new valuation, which raised it by $800,000 in just a few weeks. Our total unfunded liability for a city of 30000 is $119 million, with an annual contribution of $8.7 million. In the next slide, I provide you a trajectory of our required payments versus our revenue in the general fund. You'll notice that there's an uptick in revenue coming for next year, and that's because on August 8th, by more than 62%, the citizens of Port Huron graciously passed a public safety millage and a parks and recreation millage. This was not a silver bullet to our problems. This did not solve our challenges. What the citizens did was graciously provide us with a window of opportunity to provide structural changes to our unfunded liabilities. So this is a window of opportunity. On the next page, you'll see our pension and OPEB payments and their trajectories going forward, and you'll see that, that astronomical trajectory north. In the following page, you'll see our revenue versus expenditures, expenditures. You will see that our revenues will meet expenditures in the coming year. However, quickly after that, a new deficit emerges because of the growing art cost. Again, we have a window of opportunity, but it is not a silver bullet. I put a comparison of our general fund activity versus our annual contributions. So you'll see our police department costs us $8.9 million a year. Our fire department costs us 5.1. Our general government is 3.4. Parks and Recreation, 2.8, and so on. Our pension and OPEP payment is $8.7 million. Just to put in, put in stark contrast what that takes away from our ability to provide quality resources, higher wages to our employees. Summary of costs. For every $1 we pay an employee in wages, we have a fringe benefit rate of 86%. That's 86 cents on the dollar. Of that 86 cents, 37 cents goes to the current cost, the current employees. The remaining 49 cents goes to legacy cost. You see, we're funding not only the city of today, but at the same time, we're funding the city of yesterday. Our MERS pension census data shows us that we have 369 pension beneficiaries and 229, 220 full-time employees. Our actuaries tell us that within the next five years, that number will rise to more than 400 beneficiaries. Again, it's a shadow government. On the following slide, I show you our annual contribution, which was $4.2 million last year versus the total pension cost, which is just north of $9 million. 
The difference to stabilize and cauterize the growth of that unfunded liability in the pension fund would have been a needed an additional $5 million payment last year. We don't have an additional $5 million. This has not always been the case. Since you look at the following graph, in 2000, we were more than 103% funded. Unfunded liabilities were not always an issue in the city of Port Huron. It's really been a relatively new phenomenon in the last 15, 18 years. Uh, several things lead to that. One, uh, we had severe market conditions with the uh, Great Recession. Two, people are living longer. Three, we had faulty valuations from MERS. Outdated mortality tables, unrealistic return on investments. We paid every dime we were told to pay. There's always this misnomer that, you know, well, city government, they didn't pay what they should have been all along, and therefore they shortchanged the fund. That couldn't be further from the truth. Not only the mayor and council who sit at the dais today, but the mayor and council who sat at the dais for the last 20 years paid every single dime MERS told us, our fiduciary told us, to pay to keep that fund stable. And because the valuations use unrealistic assumptions, those valuations were flawed, and we made those payments based on flawed data. We have not sat idly by. There's always this... Uh, perspective that city government are a bunch of fat cats who get overpaid and just kind of watch this all unfold and we've done nothing. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And I want to tell you what the city of Port Huron has done. We've created uh, unique partnerships with our union and non-union employees. Our collective bargaining groups, we do not see them as the enemy or the opposition. To be quite frank, as city manager, the best partners I have found at the table for solving problems have been our collective bargaining groups. Our police, our fire, our DPW, they are at the table in good faith to find solutions to the problems that Port Huron has faced, and I, and I can't thank them enough for that. Just to give you a perspective on that, the next slide on page 14 shows you the health care coverage. So over the last decade, our collective bargaining groups have continuously taken health care cuts higher deductibles, higher co-pays. Uh, we've fallen well below the state hard cap. So that means when their wives have a baby or their kid needs their arm, you know, broken arm set, they have to pay more at the ER. They have to pay more for the prescription costs. And those are out-of-pocket costs that our, our employees have had to go through. In addition to higher health care costs out-of-pocket, they have paid significantly more in their pension. On the next two pages, 15 and 16, you'll see that we have some employee groups that are paying between 10 and north of 11% into their pension fund on an annual basis. That's up from a goose egg more than a decade ago. Our new hires, we have made reforms to our health care. Our new hires go on health care savings plans. They no longer have retiree health care benefits. That was a significant savings and helped increase the funding level of our OPEBs and reduce our unfunded liability, our OPEBs, by more than $10 million. And we appreciate that concession. So imagine this, and then we'll move into page 18. So imagine this, you're an employee in the city of Port Huron, and you've continuously paid more for health care, more for deductibles, more for your prescription drugs. You've had to pay more for your pensions out of pocket to help fund the pensions. But on 18, you will demonstrate here that we've had wage freezes and stagnant wages. So they've been doing this without a raise for a good part of the last decade. And in other words, put that frankly, our employees have taken a massive pay cut in the last couple of years. And so we appreciate them. But they all came to the table uh, to do that to solve our, uh, solve our problem. On page 19, just in the last month, on top of all these concessions and all of these shared sacrifices, our police department, our police officers union, our largest collective bargaining group, has came to an agree a new agreement with us, which bridges the pension down from 2.5 to 2% multiplier. Our overtime hours have been capped into FAC at 100 hours. And once again, they're paying higher co-pays and higher deductibles for their health care, all to solve these problems. And I appreciate their shared sacrifices. That's a story that must be told. The city jobs that you know used to be in the 80s and 90s, you could win the lottery or you could get a job for the city. Uh, it's not like that anymore. These jobs don't pay what they used to pay. The benefits are not the same. And that's a story that we must share across the state of Michigan. In addition to those sacrifices, we, in the last three years, have reduced general government spending by more than $3 million. We've streamlined, we've cut out middle management, we've privatized, and to be frank, we've reduced services to our residents to reduce $3 million of general government. That $3 million in savings was consumed, though, by the growing unfunded liability payments that we have to make on an annual basis. In addition to the reduction of general government, we reduce an additional $500,000 a year, and the mayor and council 
authorized me two years ago to begin making an additional $500,000 down payment on our pension and unfunded liabilities. And the reason for that is, you know, we got a lot of feedback at the time. So, you know, politically, you know, you're cutting an additional half a million dollars to, to pay more than your annual contributions require. You know, we're kind of worried about the politics of that, you know, how that's going to play around town. Well, I, I want to be very clear today. In the city of Port Huron, our focus has not been on making good political decisions. Our focus has been making the right policy decisions and the right decisions for the next generations and our pension beneficiaries and our, and our workers to secure their future. That $500,000 over 15 years, it's about $7.5 million in hard cash. With an 8% return, that's $14 million, worth of $14 million. And I provided a graph on page 23 to show you the return on investment. So that is today. For every dollar we invest today in paying down our unfunded liabilities, that's $2 that my daughter and your children will have to build their own future. This is about the next generation. Again, I, I tell you the story today to tell you that communities like Port Huron have identified these challenges early on. We've taken bold steps. We've come to the bargaining table with our local unions and our local employees to, to develop solutions. We've been very transparent and honest. We said, folks, we have a problem, and we need to come to the table to solve this. And working together, we have made significant progress in the last four years. And again, we believe that this is about the next generation. We believe that one in the city of Port Huron, when we promise a benefit, and I look my employees in the eyes and say, we're going to give you this and this and this, that we need to live up to that promise. And to do that, we need to fund it all along. We also believe that we should not enslave the next generation to pay off the unkept burdens and unkept promises of this generation. We believe that the next generation should use their talents and treasures to build their own future. And this is a great moral and ethical question of our time. And I submit that testimony to you, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Freed. I appreciate you being here today and sharing that uh, inspiring story. A couple questions I might have for you is, have you had a chance to look at the legislation that's in front of us? Yes. And based on what you know, because some of the, some of the um, guidelines are still in a state of flux, but based on what you know, would the city of Port Huron pass the test of the intended, the proposed guidelines? I believe uh, yes and no, depending on what the assumptions are in the valuation, will come close. Mm -hmm. uh, however, um, we've been making a plan all along, so if we have to submit a plan of action to Treasury, uh, we are fully confident that we can do that. Well, that would, that would be my follow-up question, and that is that uh, let's assume for a moment that there are some of the guidelines that you may not meet the exact expectations of the uh, proposed legislation. Have you ev evaluated the waiver process proposed in this language, this uh, legislation, and have you concluded that you would probably fall in or out of the waiver process and allow you to continue or not? I believe that we're close enough that we could apply for a waiver and probably, based on what I heard from the state treasurer, we would probably get a waiver. We have a plan of action, right. but again, um, Many years ago, about four years ago when I took over, we began really looking at this. Unfunded liabilities was always our dirty little secret. We didn't have to report them in our audits. The Gadsby rules were not changed as of yet. And so the unfunded pension and OPEB liability was no one really knew about it. And so when I came over in the city port here on doing my fiduciary review of what our current finances are, we essentially say this is a significant issue. And I believe that not only do our citizens have a right to know, but our workers and our pension beneficiaries had a right to know of just how well funded their system was, and that wasn't getting out there. No, you're to be, to be congratulated on that, but I'm trying to uh, establish a point here, and that is that based on my assessment, at least, my cursory assessment, um, I think you'd fall exactly in the category of, well, you still got some unfunded liabilities, but you, A, have a plan, and B, have, have uh, proven that you can, f you can continue the plan, C, you're actually uh, additionally paying on some of the things, and so... I don't see any reason why you probably wouldn't be uh, enthusiastically supported with a waiver to continue what you're doing. And I'm asking if you've reached that same conclusion. We have, um, and it's because several years ago when we first started looking at this, we recognized that a plan of action needs time to implement. Right. And the longer we waited, the longer we dithered, the more the severe the consequences got. And so that's why we took action sooner than later. Perfect point. In my professional opinion, 
I don't see a lot of communities across the state, I see a lot of them who are taking action, but I see some who aren't, and that makes me nervous. Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I got just two quick things. First, uh, it sounds like since you've been there, you've, you've tackled this problem in a, in a lot of di from a lot of different fronts. What do you see in this legislation, in this 16 bill package that actually helps you? How does any of what we're considering today help you move forward from where you are right now? So f first and foremost, I would speak to, I think the standardized assumptions that Treasury put out will be helpful. Um, I don't trust the valuations I get. I've been given th three or four valuations since I've been there and none of them add up and none of them make sense. I believe we need to compare apples and apples across the state of Michigan. It's hard to say one city has a problem and one city doesn't have a problem when we're using a completely different set of metrics to gauge that. So I see it as very beneficial from looking at how do we compare to other communities, is our pathway forward viable, and that help from Treasury developing those valuation standardization that will be used across the state, that is critical. I also think, uh, you know, speaking as a professional manager in the state of Michigan, I think this provides communities with an opportunity. You know, it's not like the city of Port here just woke up one day and deployed a plan of action. We had to come to the harsh realization that we actually had a problem, that unfunded liabilities is an issue. And if you do a quick Google search, up until about three, four years ago, not one public comment was made about the unfunded liabilities in the city of Port Huron. No one even knew about the problem. And so you can't tackle a problem unless you're honest and forthright with yourselves that you have a problem. And so I think public... Uh, public uh, accounting and public transparency in this issue is going to be key to making sure that we protect public employees across the state. Because if we don't admit we have a challenge and we hide it and we dither, the consequences are going to be on our pension beneficiaries and our workers. And we believe in the city of Port Huron that we have an obligation to our workers and our pension beneficiaries to take action now to protect them. And that was part of the task force report that I, I along with you know, 20 other people, did sign off on. So I, I don't think there's any argument there that that is something helpful for communities. Um, the other question that I have, and it goes to your slides like eight and nine, and you used a phrase I've never heard used in this way, so I'm curious what it means to you. So you, you talked about having, of the, of the current dollars that you're putting away, 37 cents uh, of the 86 cents goes to pay for current uh, employees, 49% uh, for legacy costs. And just a reminder, legacy costs are people. Legacy costs are real people with families and bills and things like that. And, and when you flip to, to um, slide nine, you said it's essentially a shadow government. Can you explain to me what that means? Because these are people that worked for you, for your community, before you were yeah. there maybe, but they retired after doing the job for your community. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as city manager, uh, I don't get to drive two hours away to work every day. Um, I work in the community I live in. Um, their names and faces to me. I see them at our coffee shops. I see them at t-ball games, local sporting events. These are people, these are names and faces, and that's why we took action. When I say shadow government is because the last generation didn't properly fund these, these costs, this generation is having to pay for the challenges of today while also paying off the challenges of yesterday. And it is a shadow. Every time we take a move, these legacy costs are greatly hindering our ability to deliver core public services to our residents today. If we didn't have legacy costs, I wouldn't have had to go back to the voters a month ago, two months ago, and ask for a four mil increase. So it is a shadow government. It is a significant burden on the citizens of today. Any questions? James, thank you very much. Thank you. Testimony.